looking at verses 1 through 12 together in Luke 24, risen indeed. Today in our study, the darkness finally gives way to the dawn. Jesus was dead, buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. The female followers of Jesus wanted to anoint his body and burial but simply had not been enough time on the day of his crucifixion before the Sabbath day began and they were constrained by the law of Moses to, uh, to submit themselves to that, the, the rest on the Sabbath. So during that day, the women observed the Sabbath waiting for when they might be able to anoint their Lord. We find ourselves on the first day of the week. The disciples are deeply confused, sorrowful, not sure what is going to come next. And it's here that we pick up in Luke 24. What I'm going to do this evening is I'm going to take the uh, account in Luke 24 and a large portion of our study is actually going to be taking Luke 24 and comparing it with Matthew, Mark, and John because the accounts are not just scattered but uh, seemingly contradictory. And we're going to take them all and we're going to read through them all uh, in various portions. And then I'm going to give you what, what I would term to be my theory as to how they all fit together. And then we'll talk in our application about the importance of the resurrection and understand a few important truths about it this evening. So in Luke 24, beginning in verse 1, the Bible says this. Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning... They came unto the sepulcher, bring, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. So Luke tells us on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, in Jewish culture, the morning began at 6 a.m., they came to the sepulcher. Now, when we'll find from the other Gospels, it was right about the breaking of the day. We know who they is in this context as we compare Scripture with Scripture. Luke 23, verses 55 and 56, right there at the end of Luke 23, spoke explicitly about about the women who had followed Jesus, desiring that they might anoint his body. And we continue this context, we carry this context into Luke chapter 24. Uh, it is one of the unfortunate things about the, particularly the chapter divisions that sometimes come about, that we can lose context because we stop at the end of one chapter, then the next day or the next week, depending on your reading schedule, you pick up uh, in, in the next chapter and you kind of can lose context because you forget with that nice little break in your Bible that there's continuity. And there is indeed continuity. So it's the women that we're speaking of here with the they, that they, the women, came unto the sepulcher bringing their spices on the first day of the week, which of course would be Sunday. Now the other Gospels are even more explicit about this. In Mark chapter 16, verses 1 and 2, the Bible says, And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome had, brought, had bought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came into the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. So there we have uh, the idea that it is at the rising of the sun, it is at daybreak, that they're coming to the sepulcher very early in in the morning. And here we find that Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and Salome, who we believe to be the mother of James and John, all of these women were present at the crucifixion, as we considered it last week, and they are the ones that are listed among other women that were coming on this day to anoint the body of Jesus. Matthew 28, verse 1, only lists Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. That would be Mary the mother of James and Joseph. And then John chapter 20, verse 1, only tells us of Mary Magdalene. It considers no other woman but Mary Magdalene. And this is going to complicate matters in a few moments. So here we have perhaps the best list in Mark of who was actually there. We know that there were some other women there as well. And as we head back to Luke chapter 24, verse 1, on this morning at the rising of the sun, as we know, they were bringing spices to anoint the body of Jesus. We continue in verses 2 and 3. The Bible says this, And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher, and they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. The women arrive at the stone, at the, the tomb, excuse me, and the stone had been rolled away from the sepulcher. Upon entering the tomb, the body of Jesus was not there. 
Now again, we go to the other Gospels to round out the account and perhaps to confuse us a little bit before we try to put it all together and make sense of it. In Mark chapter 16, verses 3 through 5, we read this. The Bible says, And they said among themselves, Who shall roll away the stone from the door of the sepulchre? And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. And entering into the sepulchre, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were frightened. So Mark tells us that as they were walking toward the tomb, they were discussing many things, and one of the things they were discussing, a bunch of you know, women walking toward the tomb, is how do you think we're going to get that stone rolled away? I don't know. What do you think? I don't know. And so they're trying to figure out how they're going to get this big stone rolled away from the door as they're, they're, they're heading toward the door. But when they get there, they find that the stone had already been rolled away from the door. So at this point, they enter, and they do not find Jesus. But what Mark adds, and again, as we get to Luke, we'll see that, that there's more information as we can continue, uh, they, they see a young man sitting on the right side with a long white garment, and the Bible says they were afraid. All right, so we've added through the Mark account the fact that they were walking, that they were asking, they were trying to figure out how they were going to move that stone. It was already there. They go in, and there were men there, or excuse me, a man there, as, as Mark says, in a long white garment. We add next the Matthew account, and we're going to read some things in the Matthew account that are going to be more challenging to the timetable, the, the, the minimal timetable that we've already established in our mind. Things that seem like they should contradict, but in fact they don't contradict, and we'll explain why in a moment. So in Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 5, the Bible says this, And in the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulchre. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven, came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. So here we have an account given from a different perspective. Matthew describes a great earthquake, the angel of the Lord descending from heaven, rolling back the stone and then sitting upon it. Matthew then describes the keepers, guards who had been placed there at the request of the Jewish leaders in order that the disciples of Jesus might not steal his body. And they, upon seeing the angel and the earthquake and all of these things, um, they passed out. The Bible says they fell as dead men. They were rendered unconscious. And then we find that this angel who rolled the stone away spake to the women saying, fear not. Now I want to go back to Luke a little bit more and then we'll try to put these accounts together and try to reconcile them. Chapter uh, 24 verses 4 through 6 of Luke, the Bible says this, And it came to pass, as they were much perplexed thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee. So when we put the accounts together, we find some interesting differences. Luke tells us that there were two men. Mark only mentions one man sitting in the tomb. And Matthew mentions one man sitting on the stone. But as we think about this, we can see how it's not necessarily a contradiction, right? Luke mentions two men. Matthew mentions one man. Mark mentions one man. But they were in different places, meaning that they were probably two different men. So the women entered the tomb. They see a man sitting next to Jesus' bear. They also saw a man sitting on the stone. Likely not all the women entered into the tomb. Likely uh, there were some women on the outside, some women on the inside. So there would have been some without, some within. To have two men, one on the stone, one in the tomb, would not be a contradiction and not necessarily a problem. Only as we've seen time and again among the Gospels, certain writers chose to add or remove details based upon their perspective or what they were desiring to get across or those particular people or instances that they were attempting to focus on. They have every right to do this. We also find, according to Mark and Luke accounts, that when the women arrived, the stone had already been rolled away. But in Matthew, we read the account of the stone being rolled away. Once again, there's nothing explicitly, however, that says that the women were there when the stone was rolled away. Nor is there anything that, that demands that the women saw the angel descending, felt the earthquake, any of those things. 
It's possible that Matthew chose simply to give a little bit of backstory, particularly because Matthew was the book that was written to convince the Jews, right? So the idea of the Jews, who, by the way, the Jewish leaders, we, if we would continue in the Matthew account, the Jewish leaders started this rumor. They paid the soldiers off to not say anything. And then they started a rumor that Jesus had been taken by his disciples, right? And so it would be important for Matthew to add that little tidbit to convince the Jewish readers that the rumor that they had heard that Jesus had simply been taken was not true and what actually happened at the account. So Matthew was giving this backstory to the scene before the women arrive. While this would not be a natural interpretation of Matthew alone, if we were just reading Matthew, what we would read and understand is the women are coming, an earthquake happens, the, the guards fall, fall down unconscious, the stone rolls away, the angel begins speaking to the women. That's how we would interpret it if we just had the Matthew account. But we don't just have the Matthew account. We have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And so we take the information, we put it together, and nothing is contradicting as long as we understand perspective. Now, when the, when the women saw the men in white, they were, the text tells us, perplexed, afraid, and bowed down their faces to the earth. They really had no idea what to say. This was completely unexpected, so they bowed their faces. The record of what these men say is given. They ask the women, why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. And then they ask, remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee? They speak almost in a matter-of-fact way here, emphasizing that Jesus had on many occasions while in Galilee told them this very thing, that he would die and that he would rise again. One of the times he said this, we recall in the past months, Peter actually rebuked him and said that he would not die and Jesus had to say, get thee behind me, Satan. But why didn't they understand? Certainly there was a degree to which God had simply chosen not to reveal these things through his Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God had not fallen upon them at Pentecost under the filling of the Spirit and the understanding the teaching ministry of the Spirit had not yet begun. So we can certainly recognize that to some degree it would have been for this reason that, that they did not understand when Jesus spoke about his resurrection. But there's also something else that I believe was probably going on here. We gain some insight into what these followers might have been thinking when Jesus spoke of his death and his resurrection from John 11. In John 11, we have the account of Lazarus, the brother of Martha and Mary, who had died. Jesus comes to the tomb where the women are weeping, wishing that Jesus had arrived earlier so that Lazarus may not have died. And within this context, Jesus says this, in John 11, verses 23 and 24, Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again to Martha. And Martha responds this way in verse 24. I know he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. So we find here, Jesus is going to raise Lazarus from the dead. And so says, Thy brother shall rise again to Martha. But notice Martha's thought process. As Martha interprets the words of Jesus, She's not confused by, by Jesus saying that her brother would rise again at all. She simply assumes that Jesus means that he would rise again at the resurrection at the last day. There is a resurrection of the just coming in the last day at, the, at the, the day of the Lord. And so she says, yes, I know that he will rise again during the resurrection of the just. Now, Jesus would go on to clarify that he is the resurrection and the life. And then he would go on to raise Lazarus from the dead right then and there. To this end, however, we might assume more generally that whenever Jesus spoke of his death and of his resurrection, the disciples translated his words through their understanding of the last days. That if Jesus had come to establish the kingdom, well, what had to take place before the establishment of the kingdom? The day of the Lord. The day of the Lord had to take place. And it was most certainly that there would be a resurrection before his kingdom. And so the idea that Jesus spoke of his death and then his resurrection would, again, not necessarily have been a big confusion to them within its context. But they certainly did not expect that he would be crucified on a cross and raised again three days later. 
So they didn't get the whole three days and then rising again thing, but they knew that the resurrection would happen in those last days. They believed that the kingdom was coming soon. They believed that Jesus was there to usher in the kingdom, which means that the resurrection of the just was coming soon anyway. So this talk of Jesus saying that he would have to die and resurrect, it, it, it fell on deaf ears if not just because of the blindness that was perhaps on them at the time, also because of the way that they were interpreting Jesus' claims. And so as the angel stands there that day and says, did not Jesus teach this in Galilee, he was beginning to form new connections between what Jesus had taught and the experiences that they were having at the moment and kind of tearing down their preconceived notions of what Jesus had been teaching about before, which was incorrect. We do see other words from these angels recorded in the other Gospels. In Matthew 26, 28, verses 5 and 6, the Bible says this, And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay. And then in Mark 16, verse 7, we also read, the angel saying, but go, uh, all of the things that, they, that were said in Matthew are also said in Mark, but then they add to it in Mark, but go your way, tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. We'll talk more about that next week. Tell his disciples and Peter. There shall ye see him as he said unto you. So there the angel says, go tell the disciples to meet in Galilee, to gather in Galilee. Now, the controversies and confusions don't end with what we've talked about already. What the women did after the fact is also a scattered account. And as we read them together, uh, there are some things that we need to iron out. This is, one is a bit more difficult to reconcile. It will take a little bit more speculation, but might also give us a little more insight into the day. We often, as we think, perhaps, maybe I shouldn't speak for you, I often, when I think of these accounts and when I read these accounts, I think of things happening very quickly, suddenly, and I, I kind of, in my mind, all of this stuff with Peter and John and the disciples and the women running and whatnot, it's kind of a minute sort of thing in my mind, right? You're just kind of reading through it and it's like, okay, that happens and that happens and that happens. But this was a confusing morning. And this might have actually taken place over a matter of hours, for all we know, of people kind of running and scattering and trying to figure out what's going on and thinking and talking and, and debating and, and, and running back and running forth to the tomb, back from the tomb, people crying, people don't know what's going on. And it, it, was, it, it was a confusing morning. So let's read a little bit more in Luke. We'll finish our context. And then we'll start to bring John into the mix, which gets really exciting, and we'll try to put it all together. In Luke... Uh, verses 6 through 10, excuse me, for, through 12, we read this. He is not here, but is risen, the angel speaking. Remember how he spake unto you when he was in, yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words and returned from the sepulcher and told all these things unto the eleven and to all the rest. Sorry, there's a typo there. Uh, unto all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and other women that were with them which told these things unto the apostles. And their words seemed to them as idle tales and they believed them not. Then arose Peter and ran into the sepulcher and stooping down he beheld the linen clothes laid by themselves and departed wondering in himself at that which was come to pass." Okay, so as we round out our account in Luke, this is what we find. The angel reminds the women of the words of Jesus that he must be delivered into the hands of sinners, that he must die, that he must rise again the third day, and then that he would go to Galilee. The angel links these promises of Christ to the events at hand, rewiring their expectation of Jesus' words throughout his teaching in Galilee and setting it within this brand new context with new expectations. The text says that they remembered these words as the angel was speaking to them. And the links are beginning to be drawn. Now Luke tells us that Mary Magdalene, Joanna, who had not been mentioned before, and Mary, the mother of James, and others told these things to the apostles, specifically here, the eleven. But take note that this is a very ambiguous statement. It doesn't mean all the apostles were together. It doesn't mean they told them all in the same order. And it doesn't mean that they, they, they all collectively were there for each one of these deliveries. And that's going to become important as we consider the John account. 
When the apostles heard these things, Luke tells us that they regarded it as idle tales, stories conjured up by someone without being funny at all. And then Peter arises and runs to the tomb, finding it empty, with the linens that Christ had been wrapped in still lying in the tomb and the body gone. And then he leaves, wondering what happened. Matthew and Mark give us, give us even less information about the account at hand. We read in Matthew 28, verses 8 through 10, And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy, that would be the women, and did run to bring his disciples' word. Now this is an important part. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail! And they came and held him by his feet and worshipped him. Keep that one in your mind. Then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid. Go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there shall they see me. So in Matthew, the women leave the tomb, fear and joy, bringing the disciples' word. As they went, Jesus meets them. They worship and they hold his feet, the Bible says, as they worship him. Jesus affirmed the works that he had done. He commands them the same thing the angels told them, which was that the disciples need to meet him in Galilee and that they should make their way to that region. We read this in the Mark account, Mark 16, verses 8 through 11. And they went out quickly and fled from the sepulcher, the women again, for they trembled and were amazed. Neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. Now when Jesus was risen early in the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary. Keep that in your mind. Wait a minute. He appeared first to Mary. Okay, so the women were running. He appeared to them. He appeared first to Mary. Are these the same account? We could, we could get over that, so keep that in your mind. Uh, Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. And she went and told them that had been with him as they mourned and wept. And they, when they had heard that he was alive had been seen, and had been seen of her, believed not. So Mark tells us, and John as well, as we get to John in just a moment, that Jesus appeared first to Mary Magdalene. We'll find how he did this in a moment. We'll find out that when he did this, he, she was alone. She was not with the other women when he first appeared under, uh, when Jesus first appeared under Mary, which just throws a big monkey wrench in the whole thing. We'll reconcile it in a moment. So Jesus appears first to Mary. She told the many who believe not, as we've already read. Okay, so now we're going to consider John. John's going to throw a big kink in everything, and then we're going to iron it all out. So this is, I hope you're having fun. I'm having fun. Uh, and it's going to be a little bit of extra reading here. So in John, we're going to read in chapter 20, verses 1 through 18, a big chunk here. So follow along with me as I read. The Bible says, The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulchre, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulchre. Then she runneth. And cometh to Simon Peter, and unto the other disciple, whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth, and the other disciple, and came to the sepulcher. So they ran both together. And the other disciple did outrun Peter, and came first to the sepulcher. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter, following him, and blasted right in. When into the sepulchre and see it the linen clothes lie and the napkin that was about his head not lying with the linen clothes but wrapped together in a place by itself then went in also that other disciple who is John by the way uh, which came first into the sepulchre uh, to the sepulchre and he saw and believed for as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead they didn't understand it just yet the women were beginning to understand depending on where they were in this whole mess right but these disciples weren't then the disciples went away again to their own home. But Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher and seeth two angels in white sitting the one on the head and the other on, at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she said thus, she turned herself back out of the tomb, and saw Jesus standing, and knew not it was Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, the tender there of the tomb, saith unto him, Sir, if, I have bor if thou hast borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus saith unto her, Mary. She turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, 
which is to say, Master. She recognized him. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things unto her. Okay, so with this passage, John focuses in on Mary Magdalene. He says that she came to the tomb, she saw the stone rolled away, she ran to Simon Peter and John, telling them that Jesus' body had been taken away. She didn't know who uh, took him or where. Now this is strange, since the angel that appeared to the women told these things to the women. So we'll have to deal with that in just a moment. Then uh, the James... P uh, James excuse me, Peter, John, and presumably Mary as well, because she gets there at least eventually. They run together to the tomb. John gets there first. He peeks in but doesn't go. And Peter gets there. He goes right on in. They both see that the body's missing. Peter and John then go away. Mary remains there and she is crying. She looks into the tomb where she sees two angels, one at the head of Jesus's bear, that would be the place where they laid him, and one at the foot. And she... Um, she looks in, she sees these two angels, and she, um, excuse me, uh, they, they say unto her, woman, why weepest thou? And she says, because they took away my Lord, and I don't know where they laid him. They don't say anything to her otherwise, just, I don't know where my Lord is, that's why I'm crying. And then she turns when she hears another speaking, saying, why are you weeping? She sees Jesus. She doesn't know it's Jesus. She thinks it's the tender, the gardener, the tender of the tomb there. She asks, if you know where the body is, please tell me. He says her name. She recognizes him and she goes to touch him. But he says, don't touch me yet because I've not ascended unto the father. Uh, there's a little bit of debate about exactly what this means. Presumably he had just risen. He'd not yet ascended to receive his resurrected body. Perhaps he's just in spirit. Uh, there's some debate. But she does not touch him. She goes to tell the others. And then the others hear that she has seen the risen Lord. Now, we're going to put this all together. As we put this all together, understandably there is going to be some assumption on my part. I thought through this and tried to put together what would be a coherent line of reasoning, a coherent set of steps that would put all of these accounts together in a way that does not contradict. So this is what I'm going to give you. Again, if you disagree with me on this, if you disagree with some of the timetable, that's fine. Um, I, I, I don't, I'm okay with that. But this is how I've put it together generally. So, first... The women go, hopefully that's very readable. I hope it's a little bit small. I apologize for that. First, the women go to the tomb together in the morning. They find it empty. A group of women are there. They look in. They see it empty. Second, Mary immediately runs to find the disciples, leaving the other women there. So Mary goes and she heads to the disciples right away while the other women are still there wondering. Third, the two men speak to the rest of the women tell them to go find the disciples. At this point, there's one man sitting on the, t the stone. There's another man inside the tomb in consistency with Matthew and with Luke and Mark, all of them. So hopefully they're all consistent in this process, right? So the other women are being spoken to. Mary Magdalene runs to find the disciples. She finds Peter and John. She tells Peter and John that someone has taken the Lord. She has not heard what the angel said. The other women heard what the angel said. Now the women are gone. It's kind of like one of those old cartoons where people are running back and forth and they're all missing each other. Now the women are gone and Peter and John come and Mary trails behind a little bit. Now Mary's there, Peter's there, John is there. They see that there's no one there. Peter and John leave. Now Mary is in the garden tomb by herself. The women are going to find the apostles. Peter and John have walked away. Way, and Mary is at the garden tomb by herself. This is when Jesus confronts her and appears to her. Mark and, and uh, John both tell us that Mary Magdalene was the first one uh, to see Jesus, that Jesus appeared to Mary first. And so she is alone in the garden tomb when Jesus appears to her. At this point, Jesus says, do not touch me for I have not yet ascended unto my father. He presumably has just uh, risen from the dead, but he has not received his resurrected body. For what, whatever reason, that means that she should not touch him. He's presumably just a spirit at this point. And so she does not touch him. She goes and she finds 
the disciples. Jesus ascends to the Father and he's given his resurrected bodies, body. And we know this because then he appears to the women who are running to find the disciples. And when he appears to them along the way, as Matthew tells us, they worshiped him and they grabbed his feet. Which means at that point, he did not say, stop touching me, unless they just weren't listening. Uh, but presumably, he allows them to touch him at this point, right? Because they touch him. It says that they grabbed his feet. So he has ascended up to heaven. He's received his resurrected body. Now he's appearing to them. And he uh, does so, and he tells them to go tell the disciples. The remaining disciples are then informed of Jesus' resurrection by these women. They do not believe. And that's the general timeline as we might understand it to be. Now, within this timeline, it generally reconciles pretty well. However, there are still a few kinks, a few hiccups. Remember, we read in verses 9 and 10 of Luke 24, and returned from the sepulcher and told these things unto the eleven and to all the rest, it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, mother of James, and the other women that were with them, which told these things unto the apostles. So uh, the first verse says that the women told the eleven and all the rest. And this gives the names of the women who did this, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and others. The implication, if we just read this one text alone, is that these women were together, they told the disciples together. However, our timeline contradicts this. It does not contradict the statement, though. It was the women that told the apostles. It just so happens that it was Mary alone that told Peter and John and the other women that told the other nine. This is not a contradiction. It just leaves out some information there. I'm getting some quizzical looks. I hope this is somewhat making sense here. Maybe you're just, the wheels are really grinding. I'm getting academic with you this evening. Um, so this is not a contradiction. Simply Mary told the two, the other Women told the other nine, and so Mary, Joanna, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the other women told the twelve, or the eleven, right? Okay, so uh, we've ironed out one kink. The next kink gets a little more interesting. Verses 11 and 12. Their words seemed to them as idle tales, and they believed them not. Then arose Peter. This is a problem, right? Then arose Peter, after the women told the disciples, and ran into the sepulcher, stooping down. This would seem, if we read it as it, it is translated, that, oh, I'm sorry, I haven't switched the slide here. Uh, if we read it as it's translated, this would seem as though Peter arose after the group of women told the apostles, after Jesus had, of course, appeared to them, which means Jesus must have already appeared to Mary Magdalene, which means Mary Magdalene must have already showed Peter and John that the tomb was empty and Peter of John must have already been there because they went to the tomb before Mary Magdalene even saw Jesus, which was before the other women saw Jesus, which was before they told the other apostles, which was before they could not believe, which then would contradict with the fact that then Peter arose. Except that the word then there is actually not in the Greek a statement of sequence. It is simply a, se uh, a, simply a conjunction. It does not speak to just then, but it could be but, or moreover, or and, or so, or or. It could mean a lot of different things, this conjunction. It's the most general conjunction that we have in the Greek. And so it could mean also, Peter arose, or but, Peter arose, or moreover, Peter arose, or so, Peter arose, or Peter arose. Uh, it could mean all of those things, not or, that one wouldn't fit into the context. But in other words, there's no reason why there has to be a statement of sequence here. Which means, once again, our texts do not have to contradict. They are not contradicting. They're simply a bit scattered among the Gospels. Whew, okay. So that's our academic portion. I'm sorry if your brains hurt a little bit. But this was important to me because as I was studying it, it was important that we iron this out because what we need to understand is that the Word of God is true. And we need to understand that though there are some times where we read one portion within its own context and things can sound a little bit confusing, when we put it all together and if we think through it, it can be rational as well. I'm going to change gears pretty dramatically for our application today. We're gonna to talk about the spiritual significance of the resurrection. So I'm gonna give you a moment here to settle down if your gears have been rolling as I've been kinda of rolling here. 
And let's change to a spiritual gear here instead of to a historical sequential gear as we consider the resurrection. I don't want the reality, the joy, the power of the resurrection to get muddied under the academic uh, exercise of a sequence of events in a timeline. So let's consider this evening the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And point number one that I would like us to consider, number one, the resurrection forms the basis for your eternal salvation from condemnation. 1 Corinthians 15 serves to remind the church just how essential the resurrection is to our salvation from eternal condemnation and separation from God in the lake of fire. As Paul wrote the words of 1 Corinthians 15, he wrote them because there was a growing controversy in the church about whether or not the resurrection was even necessary. The resurrection tends to be a bit of a sticking point with people. I can tell them that Jesus died on the cross for their sins, and that's okay. It's something that happened in the past. He died on the cross. His payment was for my sins. That sounds great. But when I tell them, and three days later, he rose from the dead, okay, now you're asking me to believe something that is spiritual, something that is supernatural. It's one thing to say that God placed the sins on Jesus. I don't have to believe a whole lot about Jesus' deity to believe that. I can believe that he was a good man who did something. There are plenty of religions that are built around martyrs. There are plenty of religions that are built around suffering people. But if I say Jesus rose from the dead, this is what I would call a fantastic idea. And what I mean by that is it's something unbelievable, something that is truly difficult to believe that a man rose from the dead. Why? Because this just does not happen. So why should we push it? People in Corinth were saying, we don't need the resurrection to establish salvation. Jesus' death on the cross establishes salva salvation. We don't need the resurrection. Why can't Jesus' death be enough? Why does the resurrection matter? So Paul begins in 1 Corinthians 15 to explain this. And he starts with the essence of the gospel message, which we'll talk about more thoroughly next week. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 6, the Bible says this, Paul writing, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, He was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. So the gospel is this. These are the elements of recognition in relation to the gospel. First, that we are sinners and have a need of salvation. Second, that Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures. I don't believe that Jesus died for my sins if I don't believe I have a need. If I don't believe that I have sins that are of necessity needing to be paid for. But if I am a sinner and I am thus separated from God for eternity because God is holy and I am not, then I have a need. And the gospel tells me that Jesus died on the cross for that need, that he died to pay for the sin debt of sinners, that Jesus died for our sins. The gospel is also that Jesus was buried and that three days later on the third day he rose again. Even as we've studied in Revelation in the morning series, we have seen through the letters to the churches just how important the identification with the resurrection is to Jesus. He identified himself in John's vision in Revelation 1 as he that was dead and is alive forevermore. Paul goes on to say then, I'm going to skip a few verses here in 1 Corinthians 15. He goes on to say in verses 12 and following, now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there, is, if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Jesus Christ has not risen from the dead. Verse 14, and if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. 15, yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised? 
And if Christ be not raised, here it is, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. Paul explicitly says that if Jesus has not risen from the dead, then you are still dead in your sins. Verse 18, then they which are, they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruit of them that slept. Paul states in no uncertain terms that if there is no resurrection, then Jesus Christ is not arisen. And if Christ is not arisen from the dead, then there is no salvation. I've said many times in my gospel that if I can go find Jesus' bones somewhere and worship at his bones, then he is no good to me. And the reason why I say that is because salvation was not just affected by Jesus' blood on the cross. Jesus' blood forms the payment for my sin, but his blood does not initiate or establish the power by which I can be saved from my sin. It forms the basis for my sin debt being paid, but it does not form the basis for my spirit being made alive. And if my spirit is not made alive, then, then, then I'm, I'm still in my sin. No matter what has been paid for, if the spirit of God does not quicken my spirit, does not make my spirit alive, then I'm not born again. There is no baptism of the spirit and I'm still dead in my sin. It is the power of the resurrection that establishes the power for me to be made alive in Christ, to be born again. The power to be born again comes from the resurrection, not from the crucifixion. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, then we are all doomed to an eternity of separation from God in the lake of fire. For without the resurrection, we are hopeless and helpless. So it is Paul describes the essence of Jesus' work on in that three-day span this way. Romans 4, 25, that Jesus was delivered for our offenses and raised again for our justification. Our offenses were paid for on the cross, but upon Jesus' resurrection, we, it was established that we could be justified, declared righteous. The power of salvation is established, is finalized through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. On the cross, God judicially punished Jesus for our sin. Through the resurrection, God judicially accepted the punishment as sufficient to justify the ungodly. May I say that again? When Jesus was on the cross, God judicially punished him for our sin. The payment was made. But it is the resurrection of Jesus by God that accepts the punishment, judicially accepts that punishment as sufficient so that God can both be just and justify the ungodly. Through Jesus' death, God was made just. Uh, we, we were made just. Through Jesus' resurrection, God justifies the ungodly. So point number one. The resurrection forms the basis for your eternal salvation from condemnation. Number two, we see as well, the resurrection forms the basis for your current salvation from sin. Not only has Jesus saved us through his death, burial, and resurrection from the wrath that is to come, but it is so important for us as believers to understand that Jesus' resurrection, it not only reconciled us unto God, but it broke the stranglehold of the power of sin over us. And Romans chapter 6 tells us this. And notice how Paul links the resurrection to our victory. Beginning in verse 1, Paul says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so uh, we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, here it is, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. So judicially, when we accept Christ as our Savior, God crucifies the old man with Christ, 
For he that is dead is freed from sin. So there's the, 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 that freedom. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Here it is, once again. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. So Paul appeals to the reality of the resurrection as he teaches regarding why we ought to see the tremendous grace of God given to us not as a license to continue in sin, but as a means by which to be free from sin. His appeal in this is to the resurrection. That when we accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior, we were baptized by the Holy Spirit of God. In that moment, what happens is that God judicially buries you with Christ. Your sin, it, which Jesus had already paid for, was buried with Christ, killed. And while we recognize Jesus' death on the cross paid for the sin of every man, His resurrection unto life effectively raises us to newness of life and only those who believe. If I can put it this way, the death of Jesus Christ was sufficient for the sins of every man ever lived, whether they receive it or not. But the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the quickening of our spirit, the making alive, actually the breaking of the chains, that's only effective in those who accept Jesus Christ as their Savior and so are raised to walk in newness of life. When I accept the gospel, the Father judicially buries me with Christ then enlivens my spirit through the power of the resurrection, the same spirit by which Jesus was risen from the dead to walk in newness of life. So verse 6 says that the old man being crucified with Christ in order that we should henceforth not serve sin. And so too then we, reconcile, we, we reckon ourselves to be dead to sin, alive under Christ, not allowing sin to reign over our mortal bodies to obey it in the lust thereof. To this end we find that the life of Christ establishes the template for our own victory over sin. That because we know that there is a risen Lord, because we know that the tomb is empty, we have confidence to know that sin has no more power over us if we've accepted His finished work, if we've believed on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. I'm not just dead in Christ, but I am risen with Him. Sin has no more power over me. So first, the resurrection forms the basis for your eternal salvation from condemnation. Second, the resurrection forms the basis for your current salvation from sin. But third, the resurrection also forms the basis for your spiritual motivation to live free from sin. It's a wonderful thing that sin has no more power over you. But it doesn't necessarily mean that you don't want it to have power over you. Where does that come from? Well, the resurrection is the answer to this as well. The fact that I am risen with Christ, sin has no power, I'm a new creation, coupled with the fact that I'm saved from the wrath that is to come, these truths of the resurrection form a basis of motivation for my good works as well. And in Colossians chapters 3 and 4, Paul appeals to the reality of the resurrection as the basis for me to want to be free from sin. Now, we've read several times in Colossians 3 of late. I'm going to do it again. It's come up several times. I apologize if it's getting a little bit uh, tedious. Over the past many times, I've used it. I used it on Resurrection Sunday. I've used it once since then, so this is the third time in, in two months. But I'm going to use it again. Colossians 3, verses 1 through 5, the Bible says this. If ye then be risen with Christ. There's the appeal right there, right? If you are risen with Christ... Seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, covetousness, which is idolatry. The resurrection of Jesus from the dead, my co-resurrection with him judicially today, the bodily resurrection that we are, will experience one day, forms the very essence of my motivation to do right. Yes, through the resurrection I can do right. Yes, through the resurrection I am saved from the wrath that is to come. 
But through the resurrection, I am also compelled to want to do right. Colossians 3 and 4 speak of many basic tr Christian truths. It speaks of submission and love and obedience, purity, righteousness, integrity, speaking the truth. And they all are founded upon this one call in Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. And let's just understand why. We Christians believe that Jesus was a man, 100% human, sent from God, that he lived a perfect life, that he died a sinner's death, that God placed my sin upon him, that he rose again gloriously and victoriously over the grave. What that means is that Jesus was dead and is now alive. And this is a stunning fact. Consider what that means, that he was dead, humanly dead, and is again humanly alive. The stopped heart started again. The dead brain was enlivened again. The cold corpse reinvigorated. This is not just a miracle, is it? This is immortality. This is the greatest enemy of mankind defeated. Mankind need no longer be separated from his creator. And mankind need no longer fear death. This all was achieved on your behalf without merit by a God who loves you and gave this to you when you received the gospel. Would this not then, in every imaginable way, not simply suggest our love and loyalty to him, but truly, in any properly adjusted heart, demand our love and loyalty to him? On this day, some 2,000 years ago, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead formed the basis and foundation for what we are doing here today. Now that day, some 2,000 years ago, was a day of confusion. There was a lot going on. People were running back and forth trying to figure out what had happened. There was a lot going on on that day. But this day, the confusion is over. It's been laid out. We know what happened. On that day, the resurrection of Jesus Christ stirred the hearts of those who saw it with wonder and awe. It was a fire in their hearts to share the gospel of the one who had not simply lived a good life, not simply died as an innocent man. As I mentioned, plenty of movements, plenty of religions have started around people that lived a good life or that died an innocent man. But the church operates in the power of life from the dead. That is what took root in your heart on the day you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. This is the power that rests within you and upon you through the, your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ by means of the Spirit of God to make you alive unto righteousness. Now we have not seen the risen Lord. But life from the dead is no less amazing in 2018 than it was in 32 AD. The question is, are you experiencing that power? First, have you experienced that power? Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior? Have you experienced the enlivening, that, that reality of being born again? If you've not, we read the gospel tonight. For I have delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. John 3.16, Jesus tells us, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. If you recognize here this evening that you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, that you've never experienced that, uh, that, that reality of being born again, of, of the quickening of your spirit, of the, the, the breaking free of, of sin, the Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. All that believe will receive the gift. Have you experienced that power? These second two points are for those who have experienced that power by being uh, born again, by accepting Jesus Christ as their Savior through the baptism of the Spirit of God at the moment of salvation. For you, how is your Christian life? Are you living in the power of the resurrection? You need to understand the power that is within you. You're struggling with a sin maybe many sins. 
You're struggling with a particular sin. You're, you're dealing with something and it's an uphill battle. You say, I just don't think I can do it. I don't think I can handle it. Well, you can't. But the same Spirit of God that raised Jesus from the dead is in you. And Romans tells us that that Spirit of God can quicken your mortal bodies, give you the power in your body, the same power that rose Jesus from the dead to overcome sin. And if that is the case, then it's certainly not because you can't which means it comes down to whether or not you will, whether or not you're willing, whether or not you're walking in the Spirit, whether or not you are rejecting the flesh. And this comes down to a motivation. If you've accepted Christ as your Savior, the power is in you of the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead to overcome sin, to reject sin. It doesn't mean you, you will be sinless because we, we all uh, struggle. The flesh is still there. There's still a battle raging. But there is the power. And if ye then be risen with Christ, let's seek those things which are above. Let's mortify, therefore, our members which are upon the earth. How are you doing this evening? Do you stand amazed at life from the dead? Does that amazement motivate the deepest essence of what it is for you to live this Christian life? Don't be motivated by your pastor to do or not do. Don't be motivated by your parents to do or not do. Don't be motivated by your church to do or not do. Don't be motivated by, be motivated by Christ. Is that what motivates you? Is that what compels you? Is that where the decision-making process is rooted in the reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, in the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Do you see it? Have you been discouraged? a sin that just keeps conquering? Have you submitted it to the power of the resurrection? Because that's the power that is within you. It should touch every element of our lives, how we live, how we share the gospel, the way we see people, the way we see circumstances. And the Bible anticipates no less than this. The Bible's a book of ideals. We don't always measure up to it, but the ideal is there. And it's there because it's ours. The Bible anticipates it. Let's live it.